It is time for another edition of the Fight HQ Podcast. Of course, I am Jason Foy. That is the fighter. Pete Rogers Jr. is here to break down UFC Vegas 88, which goes down on Saturday inside the UFC Apex there in Las Vegas, Nevada. As always, we appreciate you taking time out of your day to download and listen to this episode of the podcast. Of course, we're here every week for a UFC event. Of course, last week was UFC Vegas 78, where Marcin Tybura goes out there. And, uh, you know, Pete, last week on the show, you, you talked about we We both talked about it. Like, we knew what the path was in that main event, and Tybora gets the takedown and chokes him out. Yeah, I mean, it shows the volatility of, of the division. I mean, um, you, you really just don't know how those fights are going to go. Uh, that kind of binary, you, you know, Tui Vasa can land that that knockout on the feet, or if tu, or if uh, Tybora gets the takedown, that's probably all she wrote. So, uh, and that's exactly what happened. I was sitting on the couch and uh, took a Tybora TKO prop because I figured it was just going to be ground and pound. He <laughs> threw like 100 unanswered strikes on the ground up, uh, until he decided to go for the choke, and it, it irritated me because my initial play was Tybora via submission, but I'm like, dude, I don't know if Tui Vasa really has a neck to choke. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, he, I should I should have thought, man, like, you know, he, he's been choked out in the past, but that, that's that whole situation where just going inside the distance is definitely safer or, or playing the under. Yeah, exactly. And uh, congratulations to our DK contest winner, Dog74, taken down last week, scoring nearly 575 points. He had Marcin Tybura in his line. Marcin getting 120 points. Uh, it had Isaac Dolgarian, who uh, went out had a, had a great opening round, uh, goes out there and gets 67 points in a losing effort. Had Gerald Mershart at 102 points. Uh, he had Fio at 113 points. Silva at 80 points, which was someone you had talked about on the show last week that you really liked. And uh, you got also had Jacqueline who goes out there and gets that first round victory with 91 points. Of course, we'll have that DK contest up here later on this week. Uh, we'll have that in our Discord channel. By the way, one of our viewers each and every week, Coach, once again, takes down the contest, uh, what he is able to do over there. He actually put a video in Discord, uh, so you can check that out over there. He talked about his his ways of how he came up with his lineup. And, and I'll say that, man, as a, as a DFS player, I, it doesn't matter whether you're playing one lineup, 50 lineups, 500 lineups to sit there and look at someone who has gone out there and won those big contests and just to, to hear their philosophy. I always try to take that stuff in. Yeah, I try to as well. I mean, man, I, <laughs> I I'm trying to do the same thing, right? Like th that's why we play DFS. We're, we're trying to take down those tournaments and, you know, we've taken down smaller ones in the past, but uh, we're due for a big one. Um, you know, congrats to the coach, congrats to the dog, every, everybody that's been killing it. A part of the fight HQ community. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I always like hearing a lot of the, the, the top end DFS players discuss their process, discuss everything. I mean, ultimately it comes down to just exposure, right? Like mm -hmm. you just have to, you know, you get a little bit lucky with the correct exposure and then it happens. Um, you know, I, I still think like developing one lineup and, and putting a single bullet into something is such a difficult thing nowadays when it comes to simulation tools and everything. So it's getting more and more difficult. It's getting more and more frustrating from a casual player. Um, as a hardcore player, as somebody who likes to just, you know, invest in the fights each and every week, um, you know, I, I, I do like it, but uh, it, it's definitely making it a little bit more difficult for a regular DFS guy. Oh, I trust me. I, you know, there, there's, there's pros and cons of the DFS world. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and when you do, I, I mean, look, I've done the single bullet thing and, and look, it can, you got to get super crazy in, in these big contests. And, and you got to sit there and say, okay, who is going to be that underdog this week that's going to come in and catch? It? Who is going to be, you know, the Silvas of the world or, or someone, you know, that that under $7,500 option that's going to come out there and ultimately lead you to be, be optimal. So we, we're here each and every week to kind of help you out with that, of course, as we get into UFC Vegas 88. And looking at when I – I think I, I first I saw the betting odds. And there were some lines that I'll tell you, I get, but also a little surprise. And the main event is actually one of them, but just because of, and we'll talk about this here in a moment with, with Thug Rose, it's kind of like, what do you expect out of her? 
You know, I mean, mm. this is this is a a fighter who, at 115 pounds, she has win you know multiple wins against Yoanny and Jacek and, and Zhang Wiley, but also we've seen kind of the struggles there. So I don't know what to expect there. Yeah, you know, there, there's someone like a Carl Williams of yeah, he's a high price option, and I mean, look, I, I, I'm I feel pretty confident in saying this that the 100 percent takedown defense in the UFC of Justin Taffa is going away on Saturday that he's going to get taken down. But like, you know, there's I, I, there's just some of these lines I look at, and I like the the Shabazian Dobson DK line is mm-hmm. one that really sticks out to me because like with AJ Dobson, like I see the clear path to him to win the fight. I just don't know whether he can get that clear path in there. His corner is going to be different on Saturday. No Mark Coleman, you know, uh, send those healing prayers out to Mark Coleman of what he is going through. But then like there's there's fights on this card that I don't know if you agree with me. Is Kurt Hallbot, Trey Ogden, potentially a key to this slate? 100%. And I, I feel like I might be in the minority when it comes to that bout, and we'll get to it. But I'm with you, man. These 9,000 options this week, outside of Stephen Wynn, I, I don't necessarily have a ton of outright confidence in people. I mean, there's question marks about Carl Williams. He's going up against one of the most prolific power punchers uh, since Mark Hunt within the heavyweight division. Uh, Rose Namajunas. Uh, miss inconsistent miss head case who you know put up one of the worst performances of a lifetime against Carla Esparza uh, you know not necessarily having Trevor Whitman as as involved a part of their camp as they have been in the past still being a part of it a little bit but doesn't sound like he's going to be in the corner um, Emma Shabazian a guy that's shown his true colors and shown his volatility and deficiencies within mixed martial arts still getting priced as as that wonder boy type of guy um, Andre Lima, UFC debut, uh, going up against another debutant off of Dana White's contender series. So like these 9,000 options this week, there, there's some upside, but tons of volatility. The safest one for me is Steven Wynn. And it's just because I, I really like his skill set. I like his striking. I like the gym that he comes from. Um, I actually think that he has dynamite in his hands for the division too. And I know that Jarno Aaron's is a very hittable, hittable fighter. So, uh, we'll get into some of these matchups. Um, can totally see some of these underdogs coming through. I won't necessarily pick some of these underdogs mm-hmm. just because they've given me way too many reasons to not trust them. Mm-hmm. But there's paths, man. There, there, there's definitely there's definite paths. And like you know, when we talk to the, talk about Ricardo Hamosh and Julian Arosa, that that's one that makes you you really sit there and scratch your head and get a little intrigued on both sides. So uh, all in all, it's a it's a it's an okay card. We're just getting through these till uh, UFC 300, and we're getting one step closer. Each and every week, you, you know, Juicy J is one of my guys. He, he's yeah. one of those guys, especially in an underdog role. Like Julian is always a boom bust play. Oh my god! Like, like either he's going to go out to, and, and look, you're going to sweat through that thing because yeah. he's going to get hurt on the feet at some point. But mm. so, but we have seen in this version of Julian Rosa that he survives, and and, and then we get that third round finish and. You know, the other fight that I am scared to pick a side on, but might be very well the key to building an optimal lineup? Talbot Simon. That's one I thought of. There's another one. You're not going to, you, you, I'm telling you, I don't think you're going to feel good on either side of it. Who? Oh. Parkin and Usman. Yeah, I mean, it could be. I, I definitely don't feel confident on either side, but it seems like it's going to be just a sloppy heavyweight fight, you know, like. Where these guys are just heavy breathing on each other against the cage. So I'm hoping for that at least. Yeah, I mean, I would say this. I haven't started building lineups, but just looking at the salaries, I kind of get the sense that when I'm hand-building single-entry lineups, hand-building cash lineups, that I don't think it's going to be necessarily a, a difficult task. You know, there, there's some weeks where you, you get kind of in that scenario of like, oh, God, I've got to take this. Seventy four hundred, seventy five hundred dollar option that you're just not going to feel about. We'll get into it. Of course, as always, we appreciate everyone here uh, checking us out. Uh, be sure to hit the thumbs up here on the video. Subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment. Uh, you know, if you watch us after yeah. the fact, who is that underdog this week that you are really looking at and saying, you know, this might be my underdog that I have the most exposure to? We want to hear from you. Comment below so we can talk to you about these fights. But Pete, let's get right into it. Of course, the main event we got Amanda Hebas taking on Rose Nami Yunus. Of course, this is at a hundred. 125 pounds. Uh, Rose Nami USA minus 225 betting favorite. Uh, Amanda Hebas is at plus 185. By the way, I was uh, listening to the flank. Um, 
the Anakin Florian podcast, and they were doing the pronunciation of the week on Amanda yeah. Hebos. They played the audio that. file from the UFC. She, she, she says her last name twice. twice differently. Yeah, exactly. They're like, yeah, well, good luck. So, <laughs> yeah, I've listened uh, to those files, and, and sometimes it's I, I finally call it like, that was said differently the second time. But uh, Amanda Hebos is 7,000 on DK and a 9,200 for Rose Namunas. What's your thoughts, Pete? Yeah, I think it's an interesting matchup, right? Like Amanda Hebos is a very well-rounded mixed martial artist, um, prolific jiu-jitsu, uh, solid boxing, um, decent output, uh, somewhat of a durability concern regarding her chin. Uh, we, we've seen her get knocked down in the past. We've also seen her get knocked out. Um, you know, she she seems to be pretty hittable, and this is a fighter who's kind of bounced between flyweight and strawweight throughout her UFC tenure. Uh, ate, an, ate a head kick against Macy Barber. Dealt with some adversity against Luana Pinheiro. Uh, eventually came back and got the beautiful finish, a spin and hook kick into uh, into some to some stand up strikes. Seen her get uh, knocked out against Marina Rodriguez. Got dropped against Verna Jandaroba, who's a, a jiu jitsu practitioner with a heavy overhand. Um, I, I do have significant concerns about Amanda Hebos. I mean, this is a fighter where like. You know, it's it's a lightweight class. Usually, finishes in lightweight class are, are lightweight classes are hard to come by. Um, Rose Namajunas is a fighter who's knocked out Zhang Wei Li, Yuan Yin Jacek. Um, you know, on the Ultimate Fighter, had tons of submission finishes as well. Uh, submitted Michelle Waterson, Paige Van Zandt, uh, Angela Hill. Like she's well rounded in her own right. I really do think that um, that Rose Namajunas is. Um, biggest deficiency is like i feel like she might overthink sometimes or you know her biggest enemy is herself um you know you know it, it's like i don't know what it is sometimes her fight iq is in question uh kind of coasting in that carla esparza awful fight one of the worst fights we've ever seen through 136 36 significant strikes landed 37 scored 20 in a five round fight i didn't know that was possible but carla esparza didn't do much anything either uh, Rose was a little gun shy about the takedown, defended nine of them. Um, you know, going up and uh, and fighting Manon Fioro and uh, a 15 minute decision, zero of six in the takedown department, hurt her hand early on uh, through decent volume, but was pretty game throughout. I think Manon Fioro is uh, is a dangerous fighter within the division. I do feel like the the line is a little heavy towards Rose based on her resume. If I'm being honest, uh, I do expect her to win. And I do really like her here. I mean, she does have two victories over uh, Zhang Wei Li, um, a split decision and a, and a KO TKO. She's been able to go out there and put out crazy output, but we've also seen the opposite side of the coin. And I mean, Amanda Hebos does have some good jujitsu. Perhaps Hebos is able to close the distance and uh, win a round or two by, by getting and securing some takedowns, possibly threatening for a submission. But ultimately, I'm going to back Rose Namajunas with her sharp boxing, her sneaky head kick setups, um, you know, her ability to to avoid some dangerous submission uh, attempts from Amanda Hebos. And durability has never really been a question mark about Rose. I do have durab durability question marks about Amanda Hebos. It's the fight IQ for, for Rose Namajunas at times. And sometimes she's present and sometimes she seems like she doesn't want to be there. So. Give me Rose Namajunas to either get in a, a later stoppage or a, uh, a decision victory over Amanda Hebos. If you are backing Amanda Hebos, she probably is the hungrier fighter of the two, you know, in 2024. This is her on her come up. This is the biggest name a part of her career. Um, I just do think that she falls somewhat short in this performance against Rose Namajunas. Yeah, I'm with you there. I mean, I think it's it's a little kind of tough to trust Rose at this just because I, I just don't know where, where she's kind of at and what we've seen. You look at Amanda Hebos since 2021, she has alternated wins and losses. She's coming off a win, so if you like to play the little trend, you think she's going she's gonna to go out there and lose here. On the betting side, the some interesting props on, on Rose Nami Yunus, uh wins via submission plus 800. That's that's one of those ones that I wouldn't mind maybe throwing a sprinkle on. Um, you know, the decision prop plus 250, a TKO prop plus 140, Overall, I, I think it's – in these situations, you, I think you just got to be smart in kind of how you predict the fight's going to go. And I just yeah. think I, I got to go with a fighter that we know has been there, we know has been one of the best in the world for a long time, and that's why I do like uh, Rose Namajunas here. Uh, the 9200 price tag, and as, as Paul said, he, he says, I hate Rose at 9200 Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I, I don't love the price tag. I mean, I think the, the price tag is a little pricey. Um, and even though we are always going to – uh, you know, look at these five round fights and look at those as priorities. I just don't know if this is a priority for this week for me, Pete. 
Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, the five round championship experience is something that we really can't measure. Um, but it's, I mean, she's been there. She's done that. She's been in multiple five round fights against Yuan and Jacek and Zhang Wei Li, Carla Esparza. So um, whether it's pacing or just composure, she should have the advantage here over Amanda Hebas. If you look at some of her previous five round bouts, 20 against Carla Esparza, five round split decision victory over Wei, uh, Zhang Wei Li, 100.8. First round KO over Zhang Wei Li, 102. Um, five round decision over Yuan and Yajacek, 79.28, where she threw 301 significant strikes. Um, you know, it, it, it's like, I, is 100 enough? It's probably not enough on this slate. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm thinking you need 110 to 120. And I just temper expectations, but I expect Rose to win. And let's move over to our co-main event. It is Carl Williams taking on Justin Toff. Of course, he was supposed to take on Junior Toff. Of course, we all remember what happened last month. Justin Toff pulls out of his fight uh, on the, what was it, weigh-in day? Yeah, weigh-in day. Yeah. His brother steps in. Now, his brother now steps in for him in this matchup here. Carl Williams uh, is a minus 185 betting fair, plus 155 for Justin Toff. Toff is 6,900 on DK, while Carl Williams is 9,300. Pete, uh, let's get your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, this is a step up in competition for Carl Williams, right? I mean, this is a notable name. Stylistically, though, I do think that it makes sense. Uh, you have a power puncher, a very good striker against a very good wrestler. If Carl Williams decides to strike for too long, you know, he's an idiot, and he's going to get knocked out. Um, if he just kind of makes Toffa respect his hands enough to open up the takedown, now that's a, that's a recipe for success. Um, as a coach, I would be looking for Carl Williams to throw some heavy shots to get the hands up from Toffa. So he doesn't he doesn't uh, have the ability to get those underhooks quite so easily, um, but you know Carl Williams is really going to test Justin Taffa, and you know just like last week where you had Tai Tuivasa against Marcin Taibora, the striker looks really good until that striker's put on their back, and uh, especially when you you haven't been in that situation before, we've seen fighters that are in that situation time and time again making elementary mistakes, not getting an underhook, not getting on one shoulder on one hip staying square on their back, uh, minutes pass. And sometimes they're, they're basically holding on in hopes that the referee stands them up. That's kind of my fear here. Justin Toff has, what, defended two or three takedowns in his, in his entire UFC tenure, and it's been against awful competition. I mean, one against Harry Hunsucker, one against Carlos Felipe. Um, so, like, Carl Williams on Dana White's Contender Series was taking down a Penn State wrestler over and over and over and then in his UFC, we in his UFC tenure, we saw him against Lukas Breski go eight of thirteen in the takedown department, and even against Chase Sherman, who you know probably has better takedown defense than uh, than Justin Taffa. He went one of ten. So you you tell me he's going to attempt ten five plus takedowns, whatever it is, against Justin Taffa. I think that he can get one around. Um, does he finish Justin Taffa? Probably not. I mean, Carl Williams is a guy that does not have great finishing instincts. Uh, has good control time and good mat returns. Uh, this could be where two rounds he lays on top of Tafa, and the third round he's leaning on him against the cage. We've seen Tafa lose decisions in the past. We, he's lost decisions to Carlos Felipe and Jared Vandera, guys that I do think are more willing to strike than Carl Williams, but do not have that X factor of the wrestling. We know that DraftKings scoring system favors wrestlers and grapplers. Um, you know, it's like what thirteen or fourteen significant strikes equals. Uh, a takedown when, when it comes to the relationship between uh, striking versus grappling. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that Carl Williams is a solid play. Massive step up in competition. Lots of unknowns because on paper, Justin Taffa has a 100% takedown uh, defensive rating. But that's going to get tested and tested often. If he gets taken down, I don't know how well his skill set is at getting up. He definitely has no jujitsu to talk about. So, uh, I think Carl Williams at 9,300 is a fine play. Yeah, also one of the things I do like about Carl Williams is having that five-inch reach advantage in this one, but I would say what does concern me is he gets into a striking matchup, and yeah. he doesn't utilize grappling. I mean, we, we talk about this every week. It's all about having the proper fight IQ when you're going in there and realizing that, I mean, look, for, for Justin Toffa to win this matchup, he's got to make it a striking matchup. That's where you have to imagine that over the past couple of weeks, the mentality in the Carl Williams camp has been, let's get this fight to the ground, 
You know, and I always think I kind of, I kind of look at it in the way of like Ty Burrow last week against Tuivasa. Yeah. You 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 did not want to get into a striking matchup there, but if you can in that smaller cage get Justin Toffa's uh, back foot behind that black line that you see, get his back up against the fence, and then get the takedown. So I mean, but I think is if you're looking for a punt play and it's a complete punt play. I don't mind getting Justin Toffa, but you have to go in there with the mindset of if he gets taken down, you're done. Yeah, stylistically, it's not a favorable one for him. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, you want to test that takedown defense and ground game against somebody who has okay attempts or not not a chain wrestler. And Carl Williams chains together a lot. And for the heavyweight division, attempts a lot of takedowns. And that's, that's pretty rare. So um, if he goes out there, instead of trying to, like, you know, scoop up the big heavy Tafa and just try to manipulate his his balance, I think he's going to have a ton of success. Uh, also to note, Justin Tafa coming off that knee injury that forced him to pull out uh, of the initial bout too. So I don't like hearing that, especially when you're going to have to defend takedowns. I mean, like test that mobility on that knee, attempt single legs, treetop it, high C, go into a double, like just keep chaining. And I think that Carl Williams can look like a star in there. And a great point made by Sam in the YouTube chat say we're going to be oozing every time Tafa connects hard. Yeah. Anytime yeah. he connects, you're going to be hoping that uh, that uh, you know, Carl Williams is going to fall down. Let's move over to our next matchup. It's Edmund Shabazian taking on AJ Dobson. AJ Dobson, a plus 160 betting underdog, minus 190 for Shabazian. Shabazian, 9100 DK. And for Dobson, he's 7100, Pete. I'm doing it. I'm doing it, Jason. How the hell can anybody get behind a large number behind Edmund Shabazian? I, I think if you look at the uh, the name value, AJ Dobson does not have the name value that previous opponents of Shabazian has. You know what I mean? He's not an Anthony Hernandez, Nasruddin Imavov, Jack Hermanson, Derek Brunson, Brad Tavares. He's kind of in that Jack Marshman, Charles Bird, Darren Stewart, Dolce Lugambula, which are all fighters that you know Emin Shabazian has had success over. The issue, though, is that I don't think that he can go in there and just bully AJ Dobson. I really don't. I think that AJ Dobson regionally was, you know, knocking and knocking everybody out in the first round, getting some submission wins as well on Dana White's contender series, went out there and just put a pace on his opponent, hit him with tons of strikes and offensively wrestled. That is the kryptonite to Emin Shabazi. And I'm not sure what it is. I don't know if it's a fight IQ, if it's a fear of the ground, if Derek Brunson kind of gave him PTSD from that beating. I don't know what it is, but uh, Emin Shabazian's ground game is awful. Um, you know, he, his pace, his cardio seems to fall off a cliff once he meets adversity. It's not even like, it, it's just weird. It's kind of like a broken mentality in my opinion. And he could be a nice kid. I'm rooting for him. I used to, I used to pick him in a ton of stuff, but I, I'm, he's kind of at that point now where he needs to prove me pretty, you know, you know, prove me wrong, prove me wrong, go out there and just show me because he's priced as a favorite again. Um, he was priced as a massive favorite against Dolce and Lugan Bula at 9,400. 9,100 against Brunson, 9,400 against Marshman. I just think the line's a little bit too in favor of Shabazian, who's mm -hmm. given us all the red flags in the world. Now, there's tons of unknowns about A.J. Dobson, a guy who has not looked like the finisher like, that he was regionally. Uh, on the Contender Series, he went out there, put a hell of a pace on his opponent, hurt him on the feet multiple times, took him down, ended up getting a rear naked choke with no hooks. Uh, went in there against Jacob Malkoon, who is a takedown master. Uh, defended 10 takedowns, went 15 minutes with them. Um, and then went up against Armin Petrosian, you know, secured three takedowns. But Petrosian is is pretty good as long as you're not going to threaten with jiu-jitsu. And AJ Dobson was taking him up. Petrosian get back up, put a pace on him. Uh, the the Tafan and Chukwi fight, I think, is something along the lines of what we can expect. Uh, a little aggressiveness, a little forward motion. Um, attempting some takedowns. I do think that in order to break Emin Shabazian, he needs to attempt more than three takedowns, which is what he's done in the Petrosian and Nchukwi fight. I also think, though, that he, you know, we saw Derek Brunson when he closed the gap and made Shabazian uh, defend takedowns. He was throwing powerful, powerful strikes at at uh, Shabazian, and Shabazian was getting rocked, rocked and hurt and exhausted, and then. You know, I don't know, man. I'm just out on Shabazian as a massive favorite. If you want to back him here, you think that he's going to knock out Dobson, be my guest. Uh, Dobson has shown no question marks about his durability. Um, I do think that he's a pretty good striker. I do think that he's probably better over 15 minutes. There's no way that I'm going to back Shabazian to win a decision. I just have no faith. I have faith that Dobson can do it. And I also think, I know it sounds silly, the X factor of, of Mark Coleman not being a part of his camp uh, and, and dealing with this 
uh, you know, heroic act of, of going into a, a burning building to, to save his parents, um, was unable to save his dog, but, you know, suffered a lot of health issues from going in there because of smoke inhalation. I'm telling you, man, I think we might see AJ Dobson go out there more, more motivated than ever to really go out there and, and try to put on a performance for his role model in Mark Coleman, just like Matt Brown's one of his role models. I, I do think that Dobson and Coleman have a special, um, special relationship and it's, it sounds silly, but I think that's a motivating factor to possibly bring out the best of it in AJ Dobson. So I'm back in AJ Dobson here at 7,100. I mean, the reality is, is, is fires are going to get their motivations from a ton of different places. And, yeah. and this very well could be what motivates him. I mean, it, the thing is, is, and he is one of the underdogs this week that does intrigue me in, in yeah. terms of uh, from a DFS aspect. And it, it, to me, it's about showing, uh, mixing everything together. You know, I, I, I don't want to see you go out there and just have a kickboxing matchup against Edmund Shabazian because I, th I think if that happens, that's a big win for Edmund Shabazian that he has someone across the cage from him that wants to stand there. So that's where like I'm looking at this saying okay if AJ goes in there with the mindset of I got to mix my strikes and then whether early on the fight it's about fainting like you're going to take the takedown yep. to set up the takedown later on in the fight so that that's why I want to be there so I would say this I, I think Dobson getting there I do like it um, if you look at the props here the, the props tell you that, that Vegas thinks Evan Shabazian is going to win by TKO KO that's only oh, a plus yeah. that that's only at plus 130 right now. Uh, you can get A.J. Dobson, uh, TKO KO, plus 650. You also get him by decision, plus 300. I think those are both some some interesting props over there. I will say this. When I was uh, going uh, prop hunting earlier today, a lot of props were not available. I mean, typically we do this show uh, on a Thursday, so more props, or on a Friday, so more props are available. Doing the show here earlier on the week, and uh, we do want to try to get the, get the show out to you earlier on the week because you know what? Uh, this is a reality, Pete. Sometimes our opinion can change as oh, the week okay. goes as the week goes uh, on. Bro, don't get me started, okay? If you're part of the Discord community, J Jason threw this out because he wants me to get triggered. Um, no, 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 no. I'm just, I, I'm not trying to trigger you. I'm just saying that there can be things that can happen from the time we do the show yeah. to the time that the fight gets here that it alters our opinion. There might be something that, uh, look, it could be based on, I might have a conversation with somebody. And, and, and they give you some intel that maybe you didn't look at the fight that way. Or, you know, you, you see someone on the scale and you start to kind of question things. 100%. So, I mean, to kind of note about what Jason's referring to last week, right? Like we did the show, then we had weigh-ins and we had multiple fighters miss weight. And the underdog that I was most bullish on was Danny Silva. And when I watched Danny Silva get on the scale and miss by what, three, four and a half pounds, he looked exhausted. It looked like it was a very, very bad cut. And for a guy that pushes a significant pace, I said, maybe I should temper my expectations. Maybe I should temper my expectation. I should, you know, spread out my ownership and spread out my exposure. So I put in the discord, I said, you know, I've been pivoting several Danny Silva lineups to Chad and Helliger, not fading Silva now, but I had so much just going to move some of that ownership to Ann Helliger, who has some finishing potential just in case Danny Silva can't push his typical pace because of the awful weight cut, put it out there for the team. Some people missed that, and some people got really angry. Um, but guess what? You know, days pass. People miss weight. Um, if there's something that pops up like that, we're going to put it in the Discord, and uh, that's why it's free to join. You guys should join. You guys should join. Uh, the The link is below, and that's why we have a discussion in there. I mean, like if you see somebody about like uh, Yulia Stoliarenko about to have a seizure on the scale, I'm probably not going to be bullish on her no more in a fight. You know what I mean? You have to adjust in this game. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm in complete agreement. Things change. And that's why you guys got to keep your ears peeled and eyes peeled to our discord channel. And, and that's the thing. Well, when fires miss away, you just, you never know what's going on. It could, it'd be a, like, it's also one of those things of if I see a fighter step on the scale and there's an hour left in the weigh-ins and they miss weight, right. that is also, that's almost a sign to me that says, they're basically that there was a coach that said, we're done cutting weight. You're not going to make weight. I'm not going to let you deplete yourself. We're just going to get on the scale. And something that we talked about during UFC 299, one of the things the UFC wants to implement is what the Florida Athletic Commission implemented for UFC 299, where you have to weigh in in that first hour. If you miss weight, you can still have an additional hour to make weight, but you have to step on the scale within that first 60 minutes. And my understanding is this is a policy the UFC is telling all commissions they want to go to. It's efficient. 
you know what I mean? There's so much wasted time in a way in like you got guys just sitting around waiting. You got the commission waiting. Um, and, and, and then for people to still miss weight and still need the extension, well, it's just, it's just, it makes no sense. And I, uh, here would be an example of it. Carl Williams and Justin Taffa. If they wake up on Friday morning on weight, they're not going there immediately because th- as heavyweights, they know what's going to happen. You're the co-main event. So what do you got to do after these these weigh-ins for an apex card? You have to sit around to do a stare down. So why get there right when the weigh-in scale start? If you're on weight, just show up 15 minutes before it ends, hop on the scale, boom, and then do your face and, off and then leave. And medical stuff too, yeah. right? Like you have to see the, the 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 physician after weigh-ins too. So it's a whole process, and that's why it's strategic sometimes. It's like, dude, why am I going to get there and just hang around? It's, there's so much wasted time. And then when, when you just got you know done cutting weight, you're miserable. So oh, you just bro. want to feel good again. I'll give you a story. Regional show here in Tampa years ago. Mm. Commission doctor shows up late. Oh, Lord. So we having, the, the weigh-ins haven't even started. I'm just sitting there, and you you know what it's like. Fires from cutting weight are very miserable. Yeah. To put it bluntly. And then so they they made they, the doctor was making them do their medicals before they stepped on the scale. And I literally watched this doctor. Ask a dude who, I mean, was just drained from a weight cut. He goes, I need you to do, um, what do you ask? Um, Squats he has to do, st- Yeah, like 10 of them. And, and the fighter went off on the doctor. I mean, just went off. <laughs> and, I mean, yeah. It, it is, it's that behind-the-scenes stuff you see in, in the fight game that, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh it's it's interesting. Let's just say that it is interesting. Uh let's move over to our next matchup, which very well may be a very key matchup in creating lineups. That's Peyton Talbot taking on Cameron Simon. Uh Simon is a plus one thirty betting underdog minus one fifty five for Talbot. Talbot eight three hundred DK and for Cameron he is seventy nine hundred Pete. Yeah, I think this is a compelling matchup, right? I mean, you have uh basically two prospects pairing up against each other pretty early on within their career. Cameron Simon, three and one in the UFC, Peyton Talbot, one and oh against Nick Aguirre. Um, I'm pretty bullish and, and pretty high on this Peyton Talbot kid, but I really am. I, I'm in love with his striking. I love the way that he diversifies his attack. Uh, he has good pace, good tempo, good rhythm. Um, and I, I do see him picking a part of a lot of people within this division. Uh, probably not the best UFC debut, honestly. And it was pretty underwhelming, especially the guy that had him, uh, via KO and also, um, you know, rounds one and two. So for him to go out there and get a submission in round three was kind of not what I was expecting, but, uh, Nick Aguirre went out there and emptied the gas tank with takedowns, made him defend eight, uh, was unsuccessful in defending some and was controlled early on scored 68 in his debut priced at 9,500. So this is a guy that was a massive favorite closed, almost a minus 800 favorite over Nick Aguirre. And now we're getting him at 8,300, but the matchup is competitive. Cameron Simon is a very difficult out, uh, you know, debuted against Steven Coslow, Mana Martinez, Terrence Mitchell, most recently uh, losing a decision to Christian Rodriguez, who, yes, Christian Rodriguez does not even get me started with that bout last week. But, um, you know, I think it's a compelling matchup. If, if Simon can, can get some takedowns and possibly threaten for the submission, uh, he can win some rounds and possibly submit Peyton Talbot, but I do think that there is a large gap in hitability. And Cameron Simon is very hittable on the feet. Uh, I think that he can get teed off on and kind of look levels below Peyton Talbot on the feet. And I just think that we haven't seen the true debut of Peyton Talbot here. So uh, I'm going to be back in Peyton Talbot here. I love the price. I love everything. Um, if you look at the defense. For uh, Cameron Simon, the takedown defense does not look good at 44%. Um, and I just think that, you know, we could see Peyton just go out there and just mix everything together, but mainly strike. And at 8,300, I think that he's going to put on either a high volume decision or a potential KO. So I know a lot of people are Simon backers. I'm a Peyton Talbot guy this week. Yeah, this is, this is one where I could see, you know, if I'm playing 100 lineups, I might have 35 of one and 35 of the other. Yeah, just because I, I, you know, this is one of the ones of Cameron actually is one of the underdogs that I do not mind getting to, to this week. And I just think that this is going to be a little bit of a key here. But 
I do overall think that you're you're right spot on here that Talbot is probably the the way to go in here this one, but I, I do think you want to have some uh some ownership there on Cameron Simon. Let's go over to the next matchup. And by the way, this is a fight card that's had a ton of fight changes over the past couple of weeks. Yeah. And this is one of those matchups where we saw a fight change where uh, Billy Quarantillo now taking on Eustace Law. Eustace Law returning to the UFC after being cut. He's won a couple of fights there on the regional scene. Uh, he's a plus 125 betting underdog as, as Billy is minus 150. Uh, Billy 8,600 on DK. And for Eustace Law, he is 7,600. Yeah, I like this fight. I do like this fight. I, I'm I'm a fan of Billy Q. Um, I'm also a fan of Yusuf Salal, and I've been saying that this guy should have shouldn't have been cut for years now. Um, and then when I found out he was actually making his return, I was actually really excited. I, I like him. I don't know why I like him. I, I just think that the kid's good, very well rounded. Um, you know, can really pick apart a lot of people on the feet. Has excellent footwork, which I think will be key in this matchup. Uh, we've also seen him go in the takedown well in the past against a power striker in Austin Lingo. Went six of twelve in the takedown department, three of five against against Peter Barrett, three of nine against Sang Woo Choi, two of seventeen. But seventeen attempts is something that's pretty impressive. Uh, going the distance with uh, Ily Taporia, Sung Woo Choi split with Sean Woodson in a majority draw over Demond Blackshear. Those four fighters I just mentioned are all really, really, really solid. And uh, you know, do I think that you know? Featherweight's his true home, no. And you and I talked about that pre-show, and you mentioned that, and I would agree. I think that he's probably suited to climb the ranks at bantamweight. I think featherweight, he's slightly undersized. But I do think that this is a winnable fight. And I know people love Billy Q. 8,600 for a normal Billy Q fight is uh, you got to get a lot of exposure to him, usually, right? Like he, he pushes a significant pace. Uh, he weaponizes his cardio. He goes out there and uh, – he breaks his opponents the later the fight goes. Usually his opponents can't keep up. And it ain't a Billy Q fight unless he gets hurt and, it, and unless he uh, has to go through some adversity, which I don't really like as an aging veteran now. So 6-3 and three in the UFC. Um, I thought he'd look a little bit better against Damon Jackson. He did as the fight went longer, but early on, not so much. Got knocked out against Edson Barboza. If anybody has uh, cardio issues – or can get melted over time, Billy Q will look good and will come back and will put a pace on you and beat you. Um, the issue here, though, Jason, whereas I, I look at Billy Q as that pace pusher, which I usually like to back. 8600 favorable price tag if you think that Zalal sits there and stands in front of him and they just trade and get into a war. I feel like Yusuf Zalal is going to be the matador, and we're going to see Billy Q be the bull, and we're going to see excellent footwork, in-and-out movement from Zalal, uh, sneaky, sneaky striker as well. Don't underestimate his ability to hurt Billy Q. We've seen Billy Q get hurt from a lot less. Seen him get knocked out uh, on the regional scene with head kicks in the past. I think Zalal's kicks could be the difference maker here. Zalal winning via a kick, you know, a, a, a KO to the head with, with a kick is something that I'm not eliminating from the realm of possibility. But I think the way this is going to go is Zalal just outpoints him over 15 minutes um and stays out of danger and can get takedowns if he needs to billy q tends to accept takedowns off of his back scrambles will always fight for your dollar i'm picking zalal here and it may be a little contrarian pick but I i'm picking zalal i could see him hurting billy q and i can also see that footwork just being too damn good where the big where billy q is starting to become more and more like a brawler and i just don't think zalal will be there to uh to have success with that so give me zalal at 7600 you know i'm a billy q guy T you know tampa guy we, we actually don't live that far from me from each other uh i look i the one thing i keep thinking about this matchup is and, and there was a comment uh from aw talking about you know billy q's age yes he is 35 years old he'll be 36 at the end of this year and you know typically in the 145 pound weight class we, we don't see fire succeed at this late of age i mean yeah let's let's just look at you know the the what I would say most people would call the goat of this division, Alexander Volkanovsky. We've seen kind of what's happened over the last year with Alex. But one thing I think would I would have to believe that what that Factory X team has been really putting into Yusuf Zalal's headset, the mindset this week and in the last two weeks, is you gotta be ready to throw a jumping knee. Because yeah. when Billy potentially goes for a takedown, of course we saw that, you know, in the matchup against um 
Okay. That's in Barboza. Did it yeah, too. Barboza. Just told you had a brain yeah. freeze there. But like that to me, I can see where Mark Montoya has been putting that in and working on that strategy of mm-hmm. he's probably going to try for a takedown at some point. This could be our way to go about it. So um, I, I don't mind the use as well call by you, but you know, look, I. Even though I say you shouldn't bet with your heart, I gotta go with Mar. I'll go with Billy Q this week, but uh, you know, it, and of course the change in opponent in terms of this one. Next up, we got a matchup where we have a fighter with a seven-inch reach advantage. That's Fernando Padilla taking on Luis Pajijo. Pajijo at plus one forty betting underdog, minus one seventy for Padilla. Padilla eighty seven hundred. Luis he is seventy five hundred. Yeah, so I mean, interesting matchup, right? I mean, uh, pretty lean, long Fernando Padilla. Uh, for the featherweight division, um, Luis Puelo, uh, really, really talented boxer, uh, very aggressive. Uh, he kind of, he really reminds me uh, of a fighter that's just going to, you know, fight for your dollar as an underdog, which a lot of people love. As long as he's conscious, he's going to go out there and try to put a pace and break people over time with his boxing. The issue, though, is I kind of feel like he's a little one-dimensional. Um, I've seen his takedown defense in the past, not really look the best. Fernando Padilla was a guy that I was correct on against Julian Arosa, and I was incorrect against Kyle Nelson. I really thought that he was going to go in there and knock out Kyle Nelson, who had some chin issues in the past and just inconsistencies throughout his career as well. Fernando Padilla, for whatever reason, just did not show up that night. And that's why we always talk about paths to victory for, for all fighters, because None of the training camp matters if you are not present as the cage door locks behind you. You know what I mean? For 15 minutes, you have to be present, and you just got to be better than your opponent that night. Fernando Padilla should be able to use his long-range attacks, his straight punches, um, you know, elbows when it gets in close against uh, Luis Puelo. But the sneaky, sneaky path to victory here, I do think, is incorporating some takedowns or trying to find a submission somehow. Uh, Perhaps it's a club and sub situation. Fernando Padilla has a very, very good guard. If he is ever on his back, very good rubber guard, uh, but sneaky submissions and something that I was looking on his socials, a part of Timo Oyama. It's been really grinding with his wrestling. And I think that could actually help out here against Luis Puello because Puello is dangerous on the feet. Uh, accomplished boxer can hurt anybody on the feet. And if you cannot bite down on that mouthpiece and engage in a war, he'll break you. So I think that Puello is an interesting underdog to circle just because we did see Fernando Padilla kind of drop his previous bout against Kyle Nelson, who's really not that special. Um, But I just think the longer guy for the division, Fernando Padilla has the tools to make this work. He's a pretty good Muay Thai kickboxer as well. Luis Puello, just a boxer. The low kick should be there. The Muay Thai elbows, the clinch, everything should work in Padilla's favor as long as he just does not engage in a boxing bout. So, I think that I like the more well more well rounded Fernando Padilla, but as far as like an underdog to fight for your Monday, I don't I don't I don't hate the Luis Puello uh, underdog call either. The, the reach disadvantage is really what scares me because you're going to have to you know how, how do you ultimately you know get inside and make this you know kind of a gunfight? That's where it kind of scares me. So that's why I more do reach uh, do like Padilla to go out there and get the win in that matchup. Next up, we got Kurt Hallball taking on Trey Ogden. Trey Ogden minus one fifty five betting under betting favorite plus one thirty four. Kurt Hallball seventy seven hundred DK. Kurt and Trey Ogden is eighty five hundred. Pete, I'll tell you what, man. I think that. Uh... When ownership comes out, we don't have ownership yet, do we? No. When when ownership comes out, I'm probably in the minority. I think that Kurt Hallibaugh is going to be one of the most popular underdogs on the slate, and for good reason, right? Like, he throws caution to the wind, throws excellent boxing combinations, uh, look really good against Austin Hubbard, um, you know, attempted an arm bar, and then immediately went into a triangle choke. So the transition, uh, transitional Brazilian jiu-jitsu is, is really, really good. The way that he chains submissions together is is very, very good. I, I, I can't really fault him there. I do think, though, that he does have some deficiencies that were just not taken advantage of on the Ultimate Fighter and then in his previous UFC tenures. Um, if you really look at Kurt Hallibaugh, um his striking defense sits at 48%. His takedown defense sits at 50%. We've seen him get hurt in the past. We've also seen him get taken down and controlled against Pat Healy, my friend. Uh, I haven't talked to Pat in a while, but shout out to Pat Healy. Uh, Steven Seiler. 
uh, Howney Barcelos, Tiago Moises, Austin Hubbard even, they've been able to take this guy down. And if you really look at Kurt Hollibaugh, he was impressive on the, uh, on the Ultimate Fighter uh, against everybody who's been you know in the UFC and then has been cut from the UFC client, trying to climb their way back into the promotion. I do think that's, you know, the old dog still has some bad habits. Um, and I, I know everybody's going to want to get behind Kurt Hollibaugh because of the power. Trey Ogden has not really put together a breakthrough performance. If you are a box score watcher, you're like, there's no way in hell I'm getting behind Trey Ogden, 53, 16, 64, and 47. What that doesn't show is the dominance against Nicholas Moda. He was on his way to getting a submission win over Nicholas Moda before the referee intervened. Um, went three of 16 in the takedown department, owning marathon MMA, previously being under glory MMA with James Krause, developing his, uh, his cage takedowns, takedowns off the wall, the way that Krause, de- you know, does it and taught people a part of glory. And now it's trickled into everybody at marathon MMA that has really just pivoted from one gym to the other, mm-hmm. I think is going to make all the difference here. If I look at Kurt Hollibaugh. I see a guy who is a former featherweight. If I look at Trey Ogden, I see a guy who's massive, man. This is a massive man. He For a lightweight, it's impressive. He kind of looks like a welterweight for the division. He's huge. I think that the physicality is going to be on display. Um, we've seen him outpoint some strikers in the past and just go, you know, like pitter-patter back and forth with them. You know, picked up a victory over Daniel Zell Huber, who, which, which aged really, really nicely. Um, and then Nicholas Modok, who's a comparable – power puncher similar to Kurt Hollibaugh. I think that Ogden's going to surprise some people and I'm going to be in the minority here. Cause I already know, expo- I already know the ownership's not going to be on Trey Ogden. So uh, give me Trey Ogden to eventually either hurt Hollibaugh on the feet, but eventually get him down with a takedown and pick up a submission finish over Kurt Hollibaugh. You talk about marathon MMA before the name change. It, it was a, it was a syndicate gym of glory. It even had the glory name on it. Yeah. And of course, as you just bring up James Cross, I'm like, boy, that story has just gone like disappeared. I know. I, 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 it's such a sad story for many reasons, right? Like, you know, manipulating stuff like that for financial gain is inexcusable, but I was just a fan of James Cross. Like there's some other coaches that I'm not a fan of that. If that, that news happened to them, I wasn't, wouldn't necessarily be bothered by it. Uh, but the fact that I was so high on the IQ and the uh, just the, the, the entire mentality of James Krause and what he was doing for as short of a time as he was coaching, he was on he was on his way up to being one of the greatest coaches out there. I, I can honestly put that out there. He was one of those guys that I just love listening to his analysis. I, I think uh, one of the guys I'll, he he does it every once in a while, but when, and he's worked some USC broadcasts in the past when we're working the studio shows. Is, is Safe Saud? You listen to him talk and how he breaks down those. Are, anytime you can hear a coach break down a fight yeah. and that content's out there, I highly recommend going out there and, and checking it out. But yeah, I remember when it, it's been a long time since I've heard any updates on that story. But the the thought the the perception out there was it was much deeper than James Krause um, and that we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, you, you look at uh, the flyweight fighter who's uh, still yeah, suspended. By, um, yeah. Um, Molina still yeah. suspended by the Nevada commission. He cannot fight. And, you know, I, I would say the speculation is, is be, it's because of this, that, that, mm. that's uh, what it's in relation to. So we'll see what happens there. But yeah, it's just a story that's kind of gone there. But uh, yeah, I do like Trey Ogden in this one. Uh, next up, we got Ricardo Hamos taking on Julian Arosa. Hamos, a minus 160 betting fair, plus 135 for Arosa. Ricardo is 8,900 on DK. And for Juicy J, he is 7,300, Pete. What the hell do I do here? What do I do here? <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, I circled Julian Arosa. Uh, you know, like I'm at work, I'm, I'm doing stuff. And you know, when, when I have some downtime, I, I kind of just daydream about the fights, and, and that's how it helps me prepare for the show. I circle Julian Arosa because I do think that as an underdog, he has a legitimate chance to break the slate as he does every time, right? Like he goes out there, and as long as he doesn't get knocked out and he's conscious, he could throw with high volume. He's picked up victories over Hakeem Dawadu, Steven Peterson, and Charles Jordan 214, 291, and 188. That's his output of significant strikes. Two of six, three of five, and two of five in the takedown department. This is a fighter who has sneaky, sneaky jujitsu. Very good Darce chokes, anacondas. Just all in all, never been submitted in his career, which I think is interesting here going up against Ricardo Hamosh. 
Uh, Ricardo Hamos is a very good Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner, could possibly pick up some takedowns here. But I think as a coach, if you are pairing up against Julian Arosa, you're going to do everything in your power to touch that chin. My man has been knocked out a ridiculous amount of times. I think it's, what, seven, eight times within his career? Mm -hmm. Fernando Padilla, Alex Caceres, Sung Woo Choi, Julio Arce, Devontae Smith, Teruto Ishihara, and then not not even including outside the UFC. So there's something up with it, man. Like tons of miles on Julian Arosa's chin. But sometimes it checks out. It's weird. So like I don't classify Ricardo Hamosh as a uh, – as a power puncher, but you know, I don't necessarily classify Fernando Padilla as a power puncher either. It's just, can you land clean? I actually do think the uh, unpredictability of Ricardo Ramos is just going to, something's going to land, whether it's a spin and back fist, spin and elbow. Uh, it could be a kick. It could honestly just be a blitz uh, with his hands. I, I do think that we've started to see him mature into his body and also start to develop some power. I went back and watched a lot of fights of his. Kyung Ho Kang back in 2018, he was given the nod in that bout because of his powerful boxing. This boxing's good. I mean, it really is. So, like, against Zubaira Tugugov, which went the distance, he, he threw 224 significant strikes. You tell me he lands, you know, upwards of 50 to 100 significant strikes against Julian Arosa, I would imagine he gets hurt. But also, like, Julian Rosa has been dropped by numerous people. Uh, Charles Jordan, Sean Woodson, and then he's come back and won. So I just really don't know what the hell to do. I might avoid this fight just because of the volatility and perhaps, like, Arosa's winning until he doesn't. Um, but I, I am going to side with Ricardo Ramos here. I, I do think that there uh, is less durability concerns. Um, you know, Lerone Murphy and Saeed Nurmagomedov both got him to get out of there. But the the worst loss of his career is clearly the previous one against Charles Jordan, who has a pretty sneaky guillotine. That should not have happened as a Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner. So mental lapse. I'm going to back Ricardo Ramos here at 8,900. But, man, I do not feel good about it. Like I said earlier, show Juicy J to me is always a boom bust play because you, you know what you're walking into. You know the one thing about Juicy J is he he's gonna go out there and he's gonna bring the fight to his opponent. He yeah. might very well get knocked out, but uh, we have seen you know there are times where you know you walk to a fight and you, you think like oh man this is gonna be the it for and then Juicy J gets rocked somehow survives and comes back in the third round. So like as a a under 7,400 uh, play this week, I don't mind getting the Juicy J. One thing I do want to kind of go back on, we were talking about a point of how your opinions could change on things. Benoit St. Denis is on Eric Hawani's show today. He's talking about how he nearly pulled out of the Dustin Poirier fight during fight week. He goes, quote, I was tired the whole week with a staph infection. I came a bit too heavy, so with the treatment I took, the weight was not going down as usual. And Staff infection, I, I remember that week, everyone was like, oh, this isn't a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah. Well, it's so tough to tell what's legit and not because yeah. there's so much noise in the MMA community. I mean, like sometimes people are just looking for anything to to go out there and sway the community one way or another. And, you know, it didn't look anything. I've seen staff in the past, and it didn't look anything significant. You know what I mean? Odd place for staff. You can get staff anywhere, but, like, it, it, it kind of looked like something else. I mean, and you know, that's where, you know, hindsight's 2020. 20. I mean, it just, it made too much sense. Mm -hmm. The I think Dustin negotiating a five round bout for a co-main co-main event is one of the smartest tactics out there because in a three round bout, I think that's a very dangerous fight to lose five rounds against an untested guy coming up, I think was one of the smartest decisions. Granted, he only needed two rounds to make it happen, but still, I think that was just a very, very smart, uh, decision from the veteran. Yeah, and I'll tell you, if people did not see Dustin's interview uh, with Ariel, um, the you know two days after the fight, I would say go back in and watch that, and, and I think it really gives you some insight of when you're talking about where a fighter is mentally. And oh, yeah. how, you, how you just, you, you just never know. You, you see pictures on, on Instagram and, you know, as I always say, Instagram, we put out the best version of ourselves, not necessarily the real version of ourselves. Yeah. And uh, Dustin put his real version of himself out there in that interview. So I would highly recommend going out and checking it out. Next up, we got Miles Johns taking on Cody Gibson. Cody Gibson is a plus 130 betting underdog, minus 155 for Miles Johns. Miles Johns is a 200, while Cody Gibson is 8,000, Pete. 
Yeah, I mean, I really don't feel strongly about this bout. I mean, I might fade it in some of my lineups. Usually 8,200, 8,000 fights, tough to get away from. I just don't see significant upside on either side. I mean, like the volume striking of Cody Gibson in his previous performance was uh, admirable. Uh, that that was somewhat of a war against Brad Katona, a pretty good fight. Uh, in his previous tenure in the UFC, lost decisions to uh, Douglas Silva de Andrade, Aljamain Sterling, can't fault him for that, and Manny Gamburian. Um, but we've also seen him pick up a knockout against Johnny Bedford. Could he knock out Miles Johns here? I mean, he definitely could. He's going to have a reach advantage. He's going to be the taller guy. Um, he should be able to pepper him on the outside. I just don't necessarily have faith in Cody Gibson at his age in the bantamweight division to defend takedowns from a powerful Miles Johns and avoid that big overhand right too. I mean, granted, we have Miles Johns with an asterisk because of uh, his recent PED popping and you know suspension or whatever happened to overturn victory against Daniel Argetta. Um, you know, in the past he's gone one of twelve in the takedown department, two of six, zero oh of seven. Horrible, horrible efficiency. But at least he has some attempts there. I do think that he can uh, strike decently well. He's a gasser. Him type, him taking a fight on short notice is something that I don't really love all that much. Um, but you know, mixing in time with Marathon MMA, Garrett Armfield, and, and such, I do think will have leveled him up. This is a guy that, uh, you know, I think the community has been a lot higher on than myself, but I still think he's going to be able to do enough, control Cody Gibson in some rounds, and pick up a victory here at 8,200. But I don't really have str- I don't have uh, strong conviction one way or another. Uh, if you want to get to more Cody Gibson because of the volume and output, sure. Um, but I do think that Johns has has shown that he can compete consistently at the UFC level. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm okay with getting to Johns in some of my lineups at 8,200. Yeah, I mean, the one thing is, and, and a note, because uh, there, there's three fights on here where we have a fire with a significant reach advantage, and this is one of those fights. Cody Gibson has a five-inch reach advantage against Miles Johns uh, in this matchup, but uh, give, me, give me Miles Johns in this one, um, but uh, you know what, I, I see myself getting both these guys, but I, I don't know how much of a... Of a how much percentage wise I'm going to get to this matchup? Yeah. Next up, uh, we got uh, one of those nine thousand options that Pete mentioned earlier. So that he likes here, Stephen Nguyen, who is a minus one eighty betting favorite, ninety four hundred over on DraftKings, and taking on Jarno Aaron's, who is a plus one fifty betting underdog and sixty eight hundred on DK. Yeah, so I, I really like Stephen Nguyen here. I, I really do. Um, I've been a fan of his fighting style for quite some time. I watch him regionally. Uh, he throws with significant output. In addition to his output, his accuracy uh, and his and his variety of attacks is something for the feather, featherweight division to be on notice. Uh, his opponent, Jarno Ahrens, doesn't have the best defense when it comes to striking or grappling. 52% striking defense, 33% takedown defense in the UFC. Granted, small sample size. I just think that this guy, Jarno Ahrens, is very, very hittable. And whatever he throws at Stephen Wynn, I think, will be defended. If he attempts takedowns, I think Stephen Wynn will defend uh, and make him pay. Even if he gets taken down, I think that win will get back to his feet and start to separate himself over 15 minutes. Now, the reason I like him here at 9,400 is I do think that Jarno is pretty damn tough. We've seen him get knocked down in his previous bout um, uh, against uh, Sung Woo Choi and not deal well with leg kicks and not deal well with damage at certain moments. Steven Nguyen, I already know, pushes a high pace, throws with tremendous volume, um, he could be ended up, he could end up, you know, knocking down the tough Jarno Aaron's a couple times, uh, in, into an eventual finish or just a dominant decision. So, uh, the, the volume, everything that I really like about Steven Wynn, the unknowns about the other 9,000 options, you know, normally if you look at his, at his record, you see like, uh, it's a decision guy, 9,400, probably not going to go out there as since he's a striker and, and roster him all that much, but. I'm probably going to be a little bit more bullish on Stephen Wynn than the, than the than the public. I mean, maybe everybody's feeling the same way as me, but I think traditionally Carl Williams is going to have more ownership. Maybe Edmund Shabazian, Rose Nami Yunus because of the five rounds. Um, yeah, I, I just like Stephen Wynn here. I, I'm going to back him here at 9,400. I think from a parlay piece, he's one of my favorite pieces in the parlay. Um, and yeah, I mean, he, he's a he's a pretty heavy favorite, and uh, I think rightfully so. You know, Samuel mentioned, he goes, is it me or is this week feel like some dogs can sway the slate one way or the other? I mean, look, I, I think this is just one of those slates where you you look at and 
There, there's multiple underdogs I don't mind getting to. And, and I can't say that that's an every week thing for me. I mean, last week was a slate that I really didn't love a lot of underdogs. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's weird, right? Um, you know, every week it's just like, how can they score though? You know, and it all, it's all slate dependent. And, uh, you know, like Tiago Moises went out there and looked damn good for me. And I had a lot of him, but it just wasn't enough because there wasn't as much urgency. He was very patient. He was the true veteran. Him scoring 92 or 94, you know, was just not optimal. It wasn't the best, mm -hmm. especially when we had Macy Chasson go out there and just separate herself completely from Panny Kianzad. So just a slight pivot in the 9,000 option. And uh, it, it really just makes the difference in most of your lineups. Next up, we've got Rendon taking on Zal Helenkova. Zal Helenkova, 8,800 on DK. Rendon, 7,400. And Zal Helenkova is a minus 220 betting favorite, while Maserat is at plus 180, Pete. Yeah, so I tell you what, Daria uh, Zelenzakova is a solid striker. Uh, Montserrat Rendon is an okay striker, but uh, a very good jiu-jitsu practitioner, uh, multiple-time uh, you know, champion in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I believe she's from Mexico, if I or or, or something like that. Uh, but like you know, we we've started to see some development within her game as well. She actually has a jab. You know, like most fighters do not utilize their jab in MMA. It's a very underutilized piece of striking, as mm -hmm. as elementary as that is. People just stray away from establishing the jab. So, like, does it look like she's punching underwater half the time? Yeah. D does she have really slow punches? Yes. I think that Daria Zelenzakova is clearly the more explosive and faster striker of the two. Um, going back and watching her her uh, her tape was pretty painful. Seeing her get taken down and controlled and uh, kind of wilting under pressure in multiple fights was interesting, especially going up against a very physical Montserrat Rendon. Zelenzakova on the outside should be able to win majority of the minutes, but the way that Rendon works her way into the underhook position, has her opponents against the cage, doesn't have the, nest, the, the best like wrestling takedowns. Like She's not going to attempt a double leg or a single leg. She kind of gets those double unders, uses the body lock, outside trip, you know, laces the legs against the, all, all cage work. I do think that she can be pretty physical in that realm. Um, the issue is, is just like if she ate a ton of shots and then just clinches and doesn't necessarily pick up a takedown with like, you know, good efficiency, perhaps she just drops some rounds. Uh, not really a big Zelenza Kova guy this week uh, because of the fight film that I was watching. I mean, which she was, she was taken down, Jason. She was pounded out. I literally watched this girl, I forget who it was, take her down like four or five times, sat there, pounded her out, literally was exhausted and just kind of just fell to the side for beating the hell out of Zelenza Kova. Zelenza Kova reverses position, gets on top. Uh, the girl quit under pressure and basically just you know pounded her out. It was just the, the strangest turn of events, um, questionable you know strength of schedule, you know a part of her career. So I do think that the advantages lie on the grappling with Montserrat Rendon. I think the striking lies with Zelenza Kova, but there's not as big of a gap in that realm as there is on the mat. So give me uh, Montserrat Rendon to uh, to win a decision. Um, but like she could go out there and just get, you know, just get picked apart from the outside and I wouldn't be surprised, but she has a significant edge in the, in the jujitsu department. So that's why I'm going to be back in Rendon here. Yeah. That, that was just my concern with this matchup is what if it doesn't hit the mat and, and right. how does, how does Rendon win the matchup? I mean, that's kind of where, uh, you know, right before the show, I was, I was watching some film on her and, and that was kind of where my thought process went to is like. Rendon's just got to try to get this one to the ground. I mean, and, and this is where I think the smaller cage is is very much benefits her big time. You know, yep. we've always talked about that. That smaller cage to me always benefits the grappler because as a striker, you have less room to move around. And, and when you look at the dimensions of the thirty foot cage as opposed to the twenty five foot cage, if you're a striker that knows how to move around, you you can really kind of stay away from your opponent there. So that's where um, I, I do do not mind the Rendon call there. Next up, we got uh, Lima taking on Severino. Lima is a minus one eighty betting favorite, nine thousand on DK. Seven Reno is plus 150 and he is 7200 on DK. Yeah, I mean uh, this will this will be a short breakdown. I mean pretty difficult to find uh lengthy fight film out there on both fighters. I mean Andre Lima and Igor Severino, you know, both making their UFC debut. It's a flyweight bout. Um looked both of them looked pretty impressive on on Dana White's contender series. 
Uh, we had Igor Severino pick up a, a nice finish. We saw Andre Lima went out there and put together a, a, uh, a very dominant decision. I, I do think that the um, experience lies with Andre Lima as the, the elder um, and also more polished striker, mo- lots of Muay Thai kickboxing experience as well. Uh, Igor Severino is a dog as well, but like, I, I actually think that his aggressiveness can uh, be to his detriment at times against the crisp guy in Andre Lima who hits pretty hard. I don't know, man. Like, I feel like if I was just, you know, building 150 lineups, I might get way more aggressive on this fight than the public just because of the uh, uncertainties of two debuting fighters. And also, like, most most of the public's not going to want to roster these guys that we haven't seen any sample size inside the UFC, especially when that's difficult to find fight footage on them. Um, I'm still going to lean with Andre Lima here a- as a favorite, but it's not really like a – priority fight for me i mean it's going to be a pretty you know entertaining fight highly skilled fighters i just give the slight edge to andre lima i think the odds should be a little bit closer i was expecting like 8600 for lima 9000 just a little bit more elevated than, than my expectations but uh i do expect lima to get the victory here but my recommendation is if you are playing 150 lineups increase that exposure to both fighters because I, I don't think that many people will i think they'll pass on this fight yeah, it's a uh, great point she make up there. I do uh, lean Andre Lima in, in this one, but uh, you know this is one of those weeks. The nine thousand options aren't really screaming to me this week. Uh, then I got our opening matchup. We got Usman taking on Parkin. Parkin eighty four hundred. Usman seventy eight hundred. Then on the betting side, uh, Mick Parkin is a minus one forty betting favorite, while Muhammad Usman is at plus one twenty. Pete. Yeah, two underwhelming heavyweights, right? Like, I, I think that Mick Parkin looked good in his UFC debut and looked worse in his second fight against Kyle Machado. I mean, Jamal Pogues, he was he was an underdog there, cashed as a plus-128 underdog, threw 156 significant strikes, landed 95, priced as like a minus-350 favorite against Kyle Machado, threw 98 significant strikes, landed 39, decided to become a wrestler that bout, went 3 of 10 in the takedown department. Uh, Kyle Machado has very, very poor takedown defense, sneaky jujitsu off of his back, and powerful striking. So it could literally have been just the game plan for that bout against Kyle Machado. I do expect more of like a Jamal Pogues performance where he's willing to engage with Muhammad Usman. I don't expect him to get takedowns against Muhammad Usman. I expect Muhammad Usman to be the more physical fighter of the two. Um, you know, and Usman surprised me against Jake Collier. I, I think I bet Jake Collier in that bout. Just because I, I was thinking the mobile guy, mobile guy within the heavyweight division uh, has shown that he can defend some takedowns in the past, um, can go out there and piece you up from the outside. And I actually think that was a step up of competition for Muhammad Usman. And he looked good, right? Like, you, you know, his debut knocking out Zach Paoga, who was a, uh, everybody's favorite to win that that ultimate fighter you know, finale. And then, you know, picked up a very dominant decision over Junior Taffa. Uh, two of 12 in the takedown department, but uh, some significant control time with 12 minutes. Uh, picking up a decision victory over Jake Collier and, and landing some good combinations too, despite having awful technique. I hate his technique, but he went one of three in the takedown department, three minutes of control time, threw 191 significant strikes. I didn't think he was going to be able to keep up with Collier's volume and Collier's pace, and he sure did. So he's able to pick up that victory. I kind of expect the same thing here. I'm going to be favoring Muhammad Usman's physicality. He, if anybody's going to get takedowns in this bout, I think it's uh, clearly Muhammad Usman. Mm-hmm. If he gets one, he's going to secure a round. And on the feet, I just don't think that there's too much of a difference between the two. Parkin's technique's better. Usman hits way harder, throws with a little bit more uh, a more power, and uh, seems to to want to fight for your dollar a little bit. So I'll be picking Muhammad Usman to win a decision here. But uh, normally I like targeting heavyweight MMA. I don't know. I'm kind of under underweight to this fight, I think. I, I think this could be a stinker. I think it could be a 15-minute gas fest. Yeah, I mean, it's just one of those ones. I mean, it's, it's you know, the bottom third uh, of the UFC heavyweight division. And, yeah. you know, to me, it's uh, – my co-host Daniel on, on my podcast, he, he likes to make this comment. It's like – UFC heavyweight action, either it's going to be a fight that ends in five minutes or it's going to be a lackadaisical 15-minute fight where in that third round you're going to go, what the hell am I watching? Right. Yeah. You know? But yep, uh, I totally agree. Let's get right into our straight-up fight picks. The main event, uh, give me Rose Namunas. 
Yeah, I'm going to go Rose. I will take Carl Williams in the co-main event. Carl Williams. Oh, man, I... Well, you are on the fence. I am not. I'm going AJ Dobson. Oh, uh, man. Give me some I am I I'm all I out. I don't feel good on it. Uh, yeah. Give me Peyton Talbot. Peyton Talbot. You already know I'm going Billy Q. <laughs> I'm going to go Yusuf Zalal. All right. Give me Padilla. Padilla. Ogden. Trey Ogden. Give me Juicy J. Oh, shoot. All right. I'm, I'm going to go Ricardo Ramos. Uh, I'll go Miles Johns. Miles Johns. Uh, Stephen Wynn. Stephen Wynn. Uh, give me Rendon. I think she gets she pulls this one off. Yeah, I'm going to go Montserrat Rendon as well, just because of the advantages. Give me Lima. Lima. And I'll go Usman. Usman. What a weird week. Yeah. Uh, Samuel, appreciate the super chat there. Yes, yeah, another uh, UFC Apex car, which I like just to call. We're doing some fights. But it is an opportunity to make a little bit of money. Let's we'll, uh, get our to score questions in here uh, before we get out of here on this episode of the Fight HQ podcast. Uh, value plays under 8K and three core on DraftKings. As I look at value plays that I feel the most confident in, man. I feel like a lot of my under 8K are boom bus plays. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. You uh, know, I, I just I just look at it and I just say there's, there's just a lot of just boom bus plays. I mean, like A.J. Dobson could may be this, one of the safer potential op- options just because of, you know, he's 7,100. You, you can see where he can rack up some points in the grappling, so that kind of does stick out to me a little bit there. Um, yeah, I mean, Juicy J's punt play. Justin Taffa, punt play. Maybe Cameron Simon. Maybe one of those guys you look at. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm with you. I think that a lot of the ones that I'm looking at have decision upside. I, I'm not in love with a lot of the finishers under the 8K mark. I like Usman to win a decision. I like Zalal to win a decision. He could possibly knock him out. Rendon to win a, win a decision. Um, Dobson's probably the guy that I just, I could actually see, I know it sounds silly, but the whole Mark Coleman thing, like that's heavy. That's heavy on your heart. I mean, your, your, your mentor has been dealing with a lot and maybe we see a really, really motivated Dobson to go out there and try to finish Edmund Shabazian. By the way, I appreciate the uh, super chat there from Light Liker. As always, appreciate everyone who sends us a yeah. super chat there. Uh, in terms of a three cores, I don't know right now if I have. I, I think all my you know, if I'm hand building lineup, I probably start with Carl Williams, and I'm going from there. Um, but after that, whew, it's kind of tough for me to sit there and say who you know. I mean, I like Steve to win, but now I've given you a 9,400 option and 9,300 option. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're the two best plays on the slate. I, I like Stephen Wynn a lot. Um, big on Peyton Talbot this week. I know a lot of people like Cameron Simon. So if you are a part of the Simon crew, then you should just view that fight as a necessity as part of your core. And then uh, a sneaky fight that I think also one way or another is that Trey Ogden and Kurt Holobaugh fight. Mm-hmm. Like I, I think that is a necessity, and I'm going to be in the minority. I can guarantee it that we're going to see Trey Ogden under 20% at 8,500. Yeah, I mean, uh, we'll get next with a favorite core place. Uh, yeah, to me, it's Carl Williams and Steven Nguyen. Uh, favorite inside the distance fighters. Um, I would say I, I would look at Carl Williams. Um, I think the Hamos Arosa fight, both sides of that equation. I think you have to look yeah. at inside the distance. Uh, the Steven Nguyen fight, I think, is another one to look inside the distance. Uh, those would be my top ones. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Sam Sam and Like Liker, thank you guys so much. I mean, those Super Chats go a long way. We really do appreciate it. If you guys are supporting the channel, liking the video, trying to get us 150 likes, that's awesome. We're on the road to 1,000 subscribers. We, we're trying to get up you know, beyond 1,000 subscribers. It really helps. If you guys want to engage with us on the video, leave a comment about which underdogs you like. If you agree with us, disagree with us, it helps out the algorithm. It helps get that that video out there. For, for the masses to, to, to really see our product. And of course, if you're sending in a super chat, it really helps us out and shows your support for the channel. So thank you guys. Uh, Sam, I appreciate you. Uh, you mentioned about the best captain. Um, I've not seen the captain odds, but like to me, I would be looking at, uh, I mean, look, I'm, I'm sure Carl Williams is going to be super, uh, or going to be super high on there. Probably going to have high ownership on, on the main event. Um, you know, you may want, I would, 
Peyton Talbot may be someone to really pay attention to as a captain play. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I mean, he throws with significant volume. Um, I'm I'm starting to think that Peyton Talbot is going to be one of the most uh, owned fighters on the slate because of the recent line movement. I mean, pre- priced at 8,300, and now he's probably approaching minus 175 territory. Uh, they, they're going to see a lot of that movement in favor of him, making him a very good value at, at part of that low end ninth uh, 8,000. Uh, top pump plays, I, I think Justin Taffa, Julian Arroso will be my top two pump plays. But they're boom, they're boom bust plays too. Who is the first one? Uh, Justin Taffa. Yeah, man, I'm God. You know what sucks though, Jason, is because like he's not the more well rounded fighter, right? It's just that death touch. You know what I'm saying? And that's what's the most frustrating thing to mm-hmm. to try to handicap is like. You, you pick the guys that have more paths to victory, um, that have the advantages, more well-rounded skill set, and are probably the better fighters. But it doesn't always happen that way, which yeah. is very frustrating. Uh, road to match series, five and a half. That's a low number. That's a low yeah, number saying, for 13 fights. Saying more, my man. More. Yeah. Um, he asked for top parlay combos. I would be. I think this is a week where I would be trying to target some under two and a half round props uh, with some yeah. of these fights, like the Williams Taffa fight. Hamos uh, Arosa, um, um, and I, I, and I might be looking at over two and a half on Billy and Zalal. I think that's very sneaky and smart. I like that yeah. under two and a half on the Ramos and uh, yeah. Arosa side. And uh, Lone Wolf, thank you so much, and like Liker, thank you guys so much. Appreciate you, you know, those super chats coming in. It, it's really, it really does help us out. Uh, best takedown upside to me is I, I look at, at Carl Williams. Yeah, has to be. It absolutely yeah. has to be. Uh, we'll um, get this. Uh, we'll see here. Um, ranking the 9K options, we start to kind of get out of here. Uh, Williams would be number one. Nguyen would be number two for me. And then three. Two, this is where it gets tough. Three, I'd probably go Lima. Four, Rose. Five, Shabazian. Yeah, so... I'm going to I agree with some of yours. I'm going to say that Steven wins my favorite just because I don't really have a lot of faith in his opponent. Whereas Carl Williams, I am a little c- concerned about the power of Tafa. So I'm going to go win one, Williams two, Nama Yunus three, Lima four, Shabazian five. Not a big Shabazian guy this week. And I mentioned the question from Mike Liker, and this will be the final question here on, on this episode. He says, uh, got here late. One of his thoughts on Billy Q. Can I trust him? Um, I see concerns of why you could trust him. I think the age aspect of it, I think that the ability of, you know, making, you know, not having a sloppy takedown would be would something that would concern me, potentially a flying knee coming from Yusuf Zalal here. Um, and, and I think Zalal here at 145, I think he's more of a 35 or so. I think weight cut should not be a big issue. So my, my thing, and I agree with you, my thing with Billy Q, right, is his efficiency. And efficiency against plotting fighters should be a lot higher than what I'm seeing. Uh, Yusuf Zalal is going to be on his bike and he's going to have excellent footwork. If I look at the numbers, I see Kyle Nelson performance through 150 significant strikes landed 79. Gabriel Benitez, 156 landed 100. Shane Burgos through 349 landed 164. 151 against Alexander Hernandez landed only 87 and 188 and landed a hundred against Damon Jackson. So my issue is these slow, these fighters that don't have the footwork of Yusuf Zalal are not getting hit as often as you think. I, I just think that Yusuf Zalal is just going to be a little too mobile for him to deal with. So uh, we'll, we'll see, but I'm not, uh, I'm not a Billy Q backer this week. And of course, if you're not subscribed to the channel, please do that. That would really help us out a ton here. Like that video. And if you got a question about these fights, hop uh, in that comment section, myself or Pete will definitely be uh, checking those comments, answering any questions that you may have as this week goes on, who knows, maybe something changes, you know, maybe we see a fire, maybe not look great on the scale. That could change our thought process. So be sure to leave a comment. Also, we got our discord channel. We'll have our DraftKings contest later on this week. And uh, Pete, it's always a uh, great to, uh, sit here and uh, talk a little MMA with you. As uh, I already know, uh, my I do the MMA Report podcast tomorrow morning. I already know what my main topic is going to be, so I got to do a got to do a little research on this uh, UFC antitrust settlement. Yeah, make sure you guys are checking out Jason's stuff, right? Like the MMA Report, something that uh, you know I, I was listening to in the past, and that's what linked Jason and I together. Make sure you guys support his channel as well. Um, excellent conversation with, with him and his co-host. 
And uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, it's the MMA world and it's always fascinating what's going on behind the scenes and day to day seeing these matchups that, that are happening and, uh, you know, just opportunities like Dustin Poirier. I, I keep thinking about it. He, he literally could be getting that title shot and I believe he's going to be. And also we have the Bellator card on Friday afternoon. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, Bellator cards tend to be Chalk City. Um, yeah. We'll see if we can find maybe a little bit edge there on, on the gambling side. And we'll, we'll throw some picks in there in our score channel. Uh, maybe there'll be something in there. Of course, uh, that's going to be on HBO Max, which thank God I get for free from AT&T Wireless. Yeah. So it's not another streaming service I have to buy. Yep. And, and real quick, shout out to my boy, Brennan Ward, who is just put into the PFL tournament as a replacement and is now going to be a part of the tournament, trying to win a million dollars. And he'll be at my gym tonight because, uh, there are some similarities between my style and his style (laughs) and his opponent's style that, uh, I'm going to be emulating throughout this entire camp. So, uh, very excited for this opportunity and uh, can't wait to work with Brennan again. Yeah, I want to say it's April twelfth. I want to say April twelfth, April nineteenth, or something like that. Sixteenth yeah. or something. Yeah, it's 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 in that range. It's um it's week three uh, of the PFL season. Uh, of course, uh, Kyle Crushmer right. uh, he he took Kyle's spot. Kyle pulled out due to an injury. So, uh, as, as I like to say, in MMA game when opportunity knocks on your door, you got to open that bitch wide open. Oh, I love that. And you know, it's the same thing that happened to to Brendan in the first ter- tournament, but that was for Bellator. I mean, he came in as a replacement as well, and then ended up winning the whole damn thing. He's like getting a shot against the, you know, against the champ. So, Shlomenko. Uh, yeah, yeah, Shlomenko. When Shlomenko was the the god. Um. So you know, I'm really excited and can't wait to collab with him tonight. And uh, yeah. So thank you guys so much for for tuning into the show. It's earlier than usual, so that means we should definitely surpass the views definitely surpass the likes and uh, join that discord so you guys can ask questions and engage with the with the community and that is going to do it for this episode of the fight hq podcast of course we'll be back here next week to get you ready for the next apex car before we get into ufc 300 <laughs> you don't know what it is do you yeah i don't either i could not tell you who it is i actually you know who i think it is who uh, oh, I was pulling the artwork today for, for the restaurants. Uh, it might be Brandon Allen and, and Chris Curtis. Ooh, I think if, it, right. if it's yeah. not, it's something. If it's not, that's in two weeks. Okay. But yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. We, we got a couple of Apex cards before we get to UFC 300. So that's going to do it for this episode of podcast. We'll talk to you next week right here on the Fight HQ podcast.